you guys. The fact that you're doing this on a Saturday morning, I think, is awesome. Because if I didn't have to get out of bed on a Saturday, I probably wouldn't. <laughs> oh, who's to say I got out of bed? <laughs> no, it's so, all good. It's a beautiful sunny day. I got my coffee, and I'm sitting in a lounger on the deck. Beautiful. Very excited to talk with you, and really appreciate you taking the time out. Yeah, absolutely. So what, what episode are you guys on? Actually, we just recorded uh, Escape Velocity, right, Rick? Is that the one we yeah, just did today? Season season four, episode four, so a very chief-heavy episode. Yeah, and it's the, the one where you had your Oscar-worthy performance in the bar with Adama. Oh, the boiled cabbage stench of her. <laughs> yes. Wow. There you wow. go. All right. I remember that one. Yeah. Yeah, we loved <laughs> that episode. And and that scene in particular, we, we talked about it for probably 10 minutes. Dave was so impressed by it that he, he bumped you up to Oscar-worthy, even though it's television. <laughs> That's right. Wow. Yeah, I, you know. Well, I, Actually, if I remember correctly, I said I wanted to give you a couple of awards, including whatever it is they give uh, skaters at the Olympics. I, I don't follow sports, so I don't really know what skaters get at the Olympics, apparently. Like a medal of sorts, some yes. kind of medal. Right, yeah. maybe a Participation color. trophy is usually what I get. <laughs> <clears throat> so are you, did you guys watch it originally when it was happening, or did you yes. uh, come to it late, or what? No, we, we both saw it back in the 2000s when it, when it aired, and then a couple of years ago, probably about two years ago, Rick had this brilliant idea of, hey, let's do a podcast about it. So we're actually, I think for both of us, this is our second time through now because I hadn't gone back to it personally since it went off the air in, what, 2007, 2008. Oh, okay, cool. Are you finding that uh, there are people that are that are watching with you for the first time? Or is it, is it sort of like all Battlestar lovers and they're re-watching alongside? We've got both, right, Rick? I, yeah, I think it's more the latter. Um, I, I don't think there's as, as m too many first-time viewers that we, that at least that we've heard from. But uh, it's funny, you know, with the perspective of ten years, uh, ten, eleven, twelve years since you've seen it, um, you kind of see it through fresh eyes. And I think a lot of people are, are seeing it differently now than they did then, especially in light of, of various world events. Yeah, yeah. And there's been a lot of a lot of shitty TV between Battlestar and now, so you've <laughs> sort of cleansed the palate of really great TV. So. Yeah, I get that. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah. So, actually, you know, if you could, and we're going to ask you probably some of the same questions you've gotten a billion times already, but it's new to a lot of our listeners. So, if you could talk for a moment just about how you came to be cast in Battlestar Galactica, like, did you know about the original 1977 version, and, you know, what what were your thoughts on the show? Uh, oh, yeah, I was, a, I was a big fan. Star Wars had just come out, and this was Star Wars on TV every week, was sort of my thought about it, and uh, it didn't last as long as it could or should have, or we would have liked it to, and it went away. My involvement began early in my career, I was a reader for casting directors. I would read opposite the actors that are that are auditioning for parts, and uh, there was a woman named Maureen Webb, who is still a casting director, and she had gotten, was in talks with the original reimagining of Battlestar, which was going to be a continuation, and it was going to be um, Brian Singer and those guys, and they were going to just continue the story. And then that went away, and then it circled back, and it was Ron Moore and David Icke, and Kareen Mayers and Heike Bronstada. I just love saying her name. Uh, <laughs> I was a reader for them. Uh, they're two of the bigger casting directors uh, in these here parts, and they're lovely women. And uh, so they had this... Uh, they were casting this thing, and I was the reader. So I was reading opposite everybody. I originally auditioned for Apollo, which I didn't get, which is great, because <laughs> Jamie has to go to the gym, and I don't. <laughs> and then they brought me back for Gata, uh, which I didn't get, which is great, because uh, Alessandro has to do all that techy gobbledygook and loses a leg. So uh, I didn't have to do that, which was nice. And, and it was really down to... Um, <clears throat> There was nobody cast for this chief character, and uh, they got to sort of the end of the casting session and had everybody filled, and they were mulling over. Originally, Chief was supposed to be a contemporary of, of Cy Tall, or, well, Cy Tall, uh, Colonel Saul Ty. Uh, so they were both, they were supposed to be the same age, and uh, apparently someone said, uh, you know, you got a lot of old dudes in this show, in the in the sort of like producers directors meeting, and they said, oh, oh yeah, that's right. And so they said to casting, how about Aaron Douglas for this chief character? And so I went into audition 
like weeks later and completely forgot about Battlestar. And uh, Heike said, um, I was actually auditioning for The Office. I was I was auditioning for Dwight Schrute, <laughs> and, which I didn't get because Rain Wilson is amazing and I would have just ruined that show. Uh, but I went in and, and Heike said, oh, by the way, you're going to get something on that Battlestar show. We're not sure exactly what yet, but we think it's this this chief Tyrrell character. But yeah, we'll we'll let you know. So we'll let we'll tell your agent. Oh, thanks very much. And I had no idea. And so suddenly I get this chief character, and and that was that. So you got kind of the leftover part. <laughs> yeah, I got uh, I was the afterthought. Yeah, it was like <laughs> oh, you know, if there's the the redheaded stepchild. You might as well give him a sandwich. Everybody else is eating. <laughs> So you'd actually done a fair bit of TV work, I think, prior to starting uh, on Galactica. But what was your reaction upon reading the miniseries script? Was it, oh, we'll have another sci-fi series? Or was it, did you immediately kind of connect with, wow, this is something special? It had the potential to be something special. I've read so many scripts that... I've read and thought, wow, this is unbel- This is really, really great. And then you watch it, and it's just not good. They didn't execute it. I've also read scripts that were kind of like, yeah, no, I, it's meh. And then you watch it, and it's really great. So a script is just one piece of the whole process, and you got to have the right director and producers and cast and all of that. And so it was one of those, wow, this is uh, these are some serious themes here. And if they do it right it could be great and if they don't then yeah it's just going to be another backdoor pilot that doesn't go anywhere and just dies a a quick death on the sci-fi channel on friday night at 10 sort of thing but i'm glad that they did what they did and and uh, it turned out to be as great as it is now i'd like to circle back a little bit to the character because personally and rick is going to roll his eyes when i say this because i bring this up probably too frequently (laughs) but i spent some time in a maintenance squadron in the air force and my personal yeah my, my perception is that your performance as a crew chief just feels like super authentic and i was wondering did you have anything to draw on like military family members to flesh out how you approached tyrol or what kind of inspired your approach First of all, thank you. That's the best compliment I get is when real, actually, actual military people come up and say, you got it right. I mean, it's it's so cool. Like, you, if you watch a cop show with a cop, he just rolls, shakes his head, goes, they don't do that. <laughs> so the fact that we got military rights is a testament to Ron's writing and uh, the other writers. Um, I have no uh, military experience whatsoever. I had uh, grandfathers that fought in World War II, and that's it. Uh, we had a guy named uh, Ron Blecker, who is a retired U.S. Army Ranger, who was our tech advisor and came to set all through the miniseries and through season one and told us, you don't stand like that, you don't wear that like that, you don't do this, you don't do that. Uh, he took us for a three-day boot camp uh, and split us up into enlisted and officers and made us do march and do parade and uh, obstacle courses and all this stuff, which was this really cool bonding thing. So it was it was him just uh, helping us get it right. And so that's I wanted to make sure that I got it right. And so I, I asked him a lot of questions. There was a, there's a scene in the beginning of season two where we're crashed down on the planet and crash down's given me given the chief an order. Mm-hmm. And I salute him. And I said, I wouldn't salute this guy. I'm so pissed off right now. Can I just walk away and tell him to go fuck himself? <laughs> and Ron said, no, 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 no. It's the sniper salute. And I said, what? He goes, you never salute an officer in the field because then the bad guys know that that guy's in charge and <laughs> they'll take him out. And so I went, oh, so this is even better than the finger. He said, oh, any military person's going to go, ooh. So I said, oh, that's really cool. Okay. So I'm going to salute him and I'm going to stand there for 20 minutes and hold it. And uh, so it's, it's it's little pieces like that that Ron helped us get right. So I am, will be forever eternally grateful to Ron Lecker and uh, the U.S. Army Rangers. Awesome. We uh, we were actually uh, just speaking to Candace McClure uh, a few days ago, and she also told us about the boot camp, uh, which sounds like a really cool bonding experience. And, and actually, we, we've been lucky enough to interview uh, several of your fellow castmates, and we were just curious. Uh, we've kind of asked everybody, like, who who were some of your favorite actors to shoot scenes with, and and who made it a, you know really easy to bring out that that special brand of of chief intensity that you have? <laughs> Mary, Mary, and Mary. 
<laughs> she is uh, she's the greatest actor I've ever. Heard. She's absolutely uh, just incredibly special person and a lovely person and just an unbelievable actor. Uh, so yeah, there's like this scene in, in Dirty Hands at the end where it's just Chief and the President and and uh, they sit and have a drink and talk about the the union and the strike and all that stuff. Uh, that was that was amazing because it was six hours of just her and I and and the world melted away and the camera guys were suddenly gone and the sound guys were gone and it was just the two of us. It was uh, it was a really really special moment in my career that I will never forget because she's uh, she's just the best. On the on the hangar deck, there's you know um, we all just sort of we loved each other. We just uh, constant pranks and uh, goofing <laughs> around, and I mean as goofing around as you can get because it's pretty you know we're not making Seinfeld. We were we were uh, doing some serious stuff. So but the moments we could, we we try and bring a little bit of levity and and uh, have fun. I, uh, Michael Truco when he joined the cast and. Truco and I would when they when they made him a Cylon and me a Cylon. It was uh, we got to spend a lot more time together, and he's just the best guy on and off screen. And uh, so a lot of it was just we'd quote Anchorman at each other and just <laughs> goof around doing that. Ribs, I had ribs for lunch. That's why I'm doing this. And yeah, that was that was a lot of fun because they're your friends, you know, and you just you get to play with your friends. It's a it's a very very cool thing. And the chief is basically just a pissed off two year old, so just <laughs> stomp around like a toddler and yell at people. It's really it's not, not really difficult acting, that's for sure. Now, I have read that you do a great Edward James Olmos impression and you would actually read his pages on set. In the read throughs, if he wasn't there, uh I would do his voice. Because if whatever actor is not uh involved in the read through but they're in the script, you gotta give it to somebody to read. So mm -hmm. Uh, there'd be days where Grace would be herself, plus all of Trisha's characters, plus Mary. And so you just start throwing other people things. So yeah, it's it's the thing with that guy is he never remembers his lines. So you just sort of mumble and mutter and and uh, say whatever the hell you want. <laughs> it's really not hard. <laughs> Can we get a little taste of that fun. of that impression? It's fun when it's. Uh, when it's chief and that character because it's just me having a conversation with myself so yeah i'd be like hey chief you go what's up admiral get down to the deck and do the thing yeah okay <laughs> go fuck yourself <laughs> yeah <laughs> so that's pretty good that that's better than that. my adama i have to say uh <laughs> yeah, you just get really gravelly and uh and and Every every time we have to drop in a quote from the you know from the actual uh, recording of the show, Dave will do it. It, it sounds like Batman uh, pretty much every time. <laughs> yeah, I think everything sort of sounds like Batman. Yeah, <laughs> yeah which I never understood because the guy would talk like this and then he put a cowl over his face and suddenly his voice would go like this. Why? <laughs> Why does your voice go like that? I don't. I never got like maybe loosen the cowl around the throat a little bit so you don't have. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you turn into Harvey Firestein for some reason. I, don't, I never, I never got it. Yeah, you're saying it's just been an ergonomics issue the whole time. Yeah, that's all it is. It's just a little too, yeah, loosen the bone, Wilma. Maybe that's your problem. <laughs> so, uh, of course, we have to ask about the moment that you learned that the chief was a, a Cylon. And I know you probably start, told the story a hundred times. But as we and Michael Truco kind of busted us for asking as well because you know obviously that's you know was such a pivotal moment. But as Dave mentioned, there's at least some folks listening who are new to the show, so we'd just love to hear you know what you remember about that moment of learning that about your character, and was it a happy moment? Was it a shocking, scary moment? Uh, how was it? We filmed that in December. and in September, I was over at Michael Reimer's house. We would get together as a cast several times a month on the weekends and stay up really late and drink too much and have too much food. And it would always be at somebody's house. Usually like Jamie Bamber and his wife would put on a big spread or we'd go over to James Callis' house and his beautiful wife Neha would make this massive Indian food and just unbelievable. Or Michael Reimer and his wife Loretta would put on a big spread. And uh, this was happened to be Reimer's house. So I went over there early to help Loretta and, because, well, the bar was open, so I figured I'd wander down. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a bunch of papers lying around, and it was the outlines for the rest of the season. And we were filming episode 11, and so there were outlines uh, 12 through 20 and uh, of the scripts, and I just started thumbing through them, and got to, like, <laughs> episode 18, and there's music, and then what the hell is going on? So I 
went and hid in the bathroom and read them like a you know a little kid would <laughs> and uh i was in there a little too long and michael reimer's knocking on the door and what are you doing in there are you all right oh yeah just flushing the toilet and turning on the sink and now i've got these pages and i think oh shit I know what they say, but I don't know if they're real or not, and I can't let Michael know that I have them or have seen them. So I thought, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll do what I did when I was 10 years old and I was trying to sneak a Playboy into the house. Is I'll stuff it down the front of my pants and under my shirt. <laughs> so I opened the door, and the same thing happened when I was 10 years old. The pages fell against my shirt, and just like my dad, Michael Reimer said, what do you got under your shirt? Like, ah, shit. So I showed him, and he said, you can't look at this. Said, well, don't leave them lying around. <clears throat> so you can't tell anybody. So for September, October, November, and the we officially found out the day before we started filming that I wasn't allowed to say anything to anybody. So I couldn't tell Truco, and I couldn't tell Hogan, and I couldn't tell Reka or anybody. And Ron and David, I'd have to play dumb. And and uh, so when they finally told us, I I got Ron on the phone, and and uh, he sort of talked me off the ledge and said, uh, "Have we done right by you so far? And do you trust us? And so just." keep trusting us and he was obviously 100 percent right but i thought initially it was going to be you're taking a character that the fans love and you're going to turn it into somebody they hate and which really shouldn't matter to an actor because it just gets the fans more involved but uh, i think if you're going to humanize the cylons there's no better way to do it than chief and and probably uh colonel ty because those two are the most they went through the ringer the most, and, and a lot of people identify with them and all the heartache and the hardship. And and so, yeah, if you want to humanize the Cylons, you might as well make those two a couple of Cylons. And Tori for a little counterpoint. <laughs> yeah, Tori for eye candy or I don't know what the hell that was, but yeah, sure, that makes sense. <laughs> all right, so we actually, I think we mentioned earlier that we just finished watching and talking about Escape Velocity, and... One of the tentpole scenes in that episode is, you know, that Emmy-worthy performance that you gave at the bar with Edward James Olmos. You talked about your contempt for Callie. You goaded Adama into demoting you. I love that scene. And Rick and I, we just talked about it for quite a while. Do you remember shooting it? Can you talk a little bit about it? Because I find that one of the standout scenes in the entire series. Thank you. I always I always blame slash credit the writers for all the cool stuff we get to do. So. Thank you, writers, for that scene. I, the thing I remember most about that scene was the, the best take uh, wasn't filmed. We did uh, we did take one, and it was my, my close-up. And uh, we had, like, multiple cameras going, so one camera would be a little bit wider, one camera would be right on my face. So they could cut back and forth, and it would be the same take. And uh, we did a take, and the director, who happened to be Eddie, said... That's it. Great. Thanks, Aaron. Give him a pat on the shoulder and said, moving on. And then everybody froze and nobody moved. And uh, there was this moment of, why are we not moving on? And the first AD uh, had to walk over and explain that uh, they didn't roll the cameras. They thought it was a rehearsal. And so there was a lot of profanity, a lot of profanity. And, uh, and they sort of looked at me and, and I said, okay, well, go again. And uh, so what you saw on the screen was actually not the best take, but we did two more, and they liked it, and they were happy with them, and, and so that's what, uh, that's what I remember most about that was, was uh, just, uh, we always shot the rehearsal. I don't know why we didn't turn the cameras on for this one. I have no idea what happened, but we didn't, so. If that wasn't, I cannot, um, <coughs> this is just going to sound like gushing fanboy praise, but if that wasn't the best take, I cannot even imagine what the best take was, because that was pretty damn good. <laughs> well, I jumped up on the bar, and I pulled my pants off and swung them around my head, so the second take, I said, I'm not doing that again. I think I pulled a hammy, so I said, screw it, I'm just going to stay on the floor. <laughs> So here's a question: How how much is uh, Battlestar Galactica a part of your life these days? Are you are you still recognized by fans? Do you go to conventions and do all that stuff? Yeah, it usually comes up literally every day. There's something happens somewhere that people want to talk about it, or you run into people. Yesterday at the coffee shop, some woman turned to me and said, "I know you." I went, uh, "Hi." She said, <laughs> "Battlestar Galactica," and I said, "Yeah." Oh, I love that show. Oh, thank you. It was a good show. It was a great show. And then she proceeded to yammer at me while her friends stared at me like I had two goat heads. To <laughs> never seen the show. I had no idea who I was, um, which is fine with me. Yeah, and we do. I do conventions a lot. We're we're all getting together in Germany next month 
at FedCon. I think there's 14 of us going. So wow. it's going to be the biggest Battlestar reunion since literally like the last table read. It's going to be very cool. I'm very much looking forward to it. I, I love it's the only cast that I stay in touch with of every show. And they all say the same thing. You just don't. Everybody talks about how oh, we were a big, happy family and we all stay in touch. You just don't. That's nonsense. I, I don't. I don't speak to anybody from any other show I've done. <laughs> uh, just you just you, you shake hands and let's keep in touch and you exchange phone numbers and then just ninja dust you're gone. But we uh, we genuinely stay in touch and get together whenever we can. And certainly at this convention, it's going to be a lot of booze behind the scenes and uh, some nice dinners and a lot of laughs. It's uh, they're great. I I love these people like they're my family. My next question is going to be a variation of the old "What's on your iPod?" I'm curious, uh, what TV do you watch right now? What What are you enjoying? Oh, I, I love this question. There's so much great stuff on right now. If I mean, my my go to is is uh, uh, like if I'm just sort of shutting down and I want to have uh, just a, some mindless brainlessness uh, before I go to sleep, I'll either chuck on a, a Bob's Burgers or a Seinfeld. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, <laughs> One of my favorite new shows that that I can't believe somebody they let somebody make is called Big Mouth. Oh yeah, do you know this Jason one? Jason Manzukis. Oh, oh my God, it is the funniest thing I've I've seen in a long time. It's unbelievable. Uh, so if anybody out there doesn't watch Big Mouth, watch Big Mouth. It's just it's if you've ever been 14 years old, it's exactly what happens to you when you're 14 years old. <laughs> it's unbelievable. But there's a lot of great a lot of great scripted stuff. I I typically tend to watch. Uh, more of the cable stuff, stuff from overseas. I, I enjoy that show, Billions, I think is great. I think Ray Donovan's one of the best things on TV. Yeah, God, I'm just all over the map. Uh, there's, there's stuff from the UK that I really like, like Shetland, Happy Valley, Broadchurch, Foils War. These just kind of the, the very typical British dramas. I don't really watch network shows, so I don't have really... I can't identify with any of those things except for, you know, Bob's Burgers, Family Guy occasionally. Mm -hmm. But that's about it. I just, I, and I don't watch week to week either. I, I wait till it's all done. Yeah, uh, Dave and I talk about this routinely that there's, there's so much good television on uh, today that it's just, it's hard to find time to, to keep up on, on everything. I, I'm a huge Bob's Burgers fan too. I uh, discovered that maybe a year ago, and just my whole family we binged the first five seasons, six seasons, oh, and now we watch it week so to week. So jealous of you! Oh gosh, <laughs> <The> best. <laughs> it's so great. Yeah, and so speaking of television um, and movies, uh, before we kind of wrap things up, we want to hear about the stuff that you're working on now. I know uh, I think you have a recurring role on The Imposters, uh, among other shows. So tell us what you're working on and what's coming up. Imposters is done for me. I just did season one, and that was one of the best experiences of my life. Uh, an amazing show, great cast and crew, and now I'm working, uh, I just wrote my first comic book for Aftershock Comics, which is a very cool thing. We launched it at C2E2 in Chicago a couple weeks ago. They put the my buddy, who's uh, uh, one of the top guys there, Joe Pruitt, uh, who's a big comic book writer, wanted to wants to launch me into the comic book world so he put me in a, a short story in their anthology shock which is like Neil Gaiman and Bill Willingham just a ton of big time writers and artists and so I'm standing on the shoulders of giants as I do that uh, which is a very cool thing I do in a, a small arc on season two of a show called salvation which is a CBS show and uh, I'm st next week I start a show called unspeakable which is an eight-part miniseries for CBC in Canada and AMC Sundance in the U.S. and around the world. And that's going to be one of those highly critically acclaimed blah, blah, blah things, which is um, the scripts are unbelievable. So it's another one of those, if they execute it right, it's going to be just amazing. And I'm very pleased to be a part of that. Beautiful. Good luck with all of that. Yeah. Thank you. Well, listen, Aaron, thank you so much. We're going to let you get back to your Saturday. Um, really appreciate you taking the time out to do this. Um, really excited to share this with, with all of our listeners. So um, uh, just thank you again for joining us. Really appreciate it. Yep, thanks Absolutely, so much. Absolutely, not at all. Have a great okay. weekend. Yeah, you, you too. too. All right, bye, guys.